Welcome to the first in a series of special NIH history lectures in which we look into our past and discuss our future. I'm Michael Gottesman, the Deputy Director for Intramural Research at the NIH. Today, you will hear about the NIH Associate Training Program, aptly abbreviated ATP, and the remarkable group of medical school graduates that this brought to the NIH between 1953 and 1973. The program enabled these recent graduates to fulfill their military draft obligation by serving at the NIH, conducting clinical or laboratory research. Please keep in mind that during these years, all young men were eligible for the draft and a large percentage went to war. For at least some of these years, there was a doctor's draft, which required all recent medical school graduates to serve. When word got out that they could honor their draft obligation here at the NIH, we became a premier destination for the most research-oriented of these medical graduates. Others went to the CDC and to the Indian Health Service. The highly selected individuals recruited to the NIH for the ATP received training and networking opportunities not available to others. Research has since revealed that they were approximately 50% more likely to serve as full professors, twice as likely to become chairs of a department, and three times as likely to become a dean. Associate trainees were also more likely to hold positions at top-ranked medical schools to fill leadership roles in the NIH, witness, for example, um, myself, and to win prestigious awards and honorary society memberships. These statistics I cite are from a scholarly paper from 2011 titled The Vietnam War and Medical Research, Untold Legacy of the U.S. Doctor Draft and the NIH Yellow Berets by first author Sandeep Kutt, a past Stettin History Fellow at the NIH. The term Yellow Berets was originally derogatory, contrasting these medical graduates to the brave Green Berets who fought in the war. But many ATPs adopted the term quite happily. Um, I should add that I myself was an ATP, as was my deputy Richard Wyatt, and many in NIH leadership positions currently, such as Richard Hodes, John Gallen, Tony Fauci, and so was our recent Nobel laureate, Harvey Alter. We strongly value the insights that clinician scientists bring to the NIH. So coincidentally, but with great excitement, I can mention that today we and the Lasker Foundation are announcing five new Lasker clinical research scholars. This is an intramural extramural partnership to nurture the next generation of clinical researchers. We currently have a group of about 30 Lasker clinical scholars at the NIH. The program was started just eight years ago. The names of uh, the uh, people who will be now today's new Lasker scholars are Yogan Kanthi from NHLBI, Jacqueline Mays from NIDCR, Ian Miles from NIAID, Allison Boyce from NIDCR, and Stephanie Chung from NIDDK. We're very proud of their achievements and looking forward to many more as they begin their careers at the NIH. Our speaker today, Raymond Greenberg, has focused part of his scholarly research on four particularly remarkable physician scientists who arrived at the NIH during the height of the Vietnam War and who in the years to follow, indisputably aided by their training at the NIH, earned Nobel Prizes. Dr. Greenberg details how they came to the NIH and how the mentorship and opportunities afforded to them would revolutionize medicine at the end of the 20th century. Dr. Greenberg is a nationally recognized academic health leader with decades of experience as both a scientist and an administrator, yet clearly someone with a passion for history. After receiving his undergraduate training from the University of North Carolina, Dr. Greenberg earned a medical degree from Duke University, followed by an MPH from Harvard and then a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina. Dr. Greenberg is currently professor of epidemiology, human genetics and environmental sciences at the School of Public Health at UT Health Science Center at Houston. Prior to this new position, he was executive vice chancellor for health affairs at the University of Texas system and he served as president of the Medical University of South Carolina, vice president for academic affairs and provost at the Medical University of South Carolina 
and founding dean of the Rowland School of Public Health at Emory University. Quite a respectable background. Remarkably, he finds time to write and he writes quite well. He's the author of a book with the same title as today's talk, Medal Winners, How the Vietnam War Launched Nobel Careers. Here it is, right next to me. Published this year by University of Texas Health Press. And so, without further ado, let me hand the virtual mic over to Dr. Greenberg. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Gottesman. It's a um, great privilege and pleasure for me to be part of this uh, speaker sp series and uh, especially to uh, be involved in presenting an important piece of NIH history to the NIH community. What we're gonna be talking about today was described by two Nobel laureates, Joe Goldstein and Mike Brown as the uh, golden era of Nobel laureates and also a golden era at, at NIH. They wrote a paper that was published in Science in 2012 and it talked about the fact that at that time, between the years 1964 and 72, nine uh, future Nobel laureates all came to train at the NIH. Uh, they came there because NIH was uh, an attractive alternative, as Dr. Gottesman said, to uh, the military doctor draft. Each trainee had an outstanding mentor. We'll talk about them. Their trainees were introduced by their mentors into uh, fundamentals of basic biological research. Uh, and then uh, all nine of these particular individuals departed NIH after their training and went on to pursue academic careers. The nine that they wrote about are listed here, uh, and I've grouped them by time period. And uh, because there really isn't uh, an opportunity to speak about all nine of them, I chose to focus on four that came in in a single year, almost half of the group came in in 1968. Joe Goldstein, Michael Brown, Harold Varmus, and Bob Lefkowitz. Uh, now, as uh, Dr. Gottesman pointed out, there is a, a new addition to that original list of nine, and that's uh, Dr. Harvey Alter, who remains at NIH for his whole career, uh, was just uh, announced last month as a, this year's recipient, uh, co-recipient, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Uh, so he is the 10th uh, recipient. And as Alan Schechter pointed out to me, if we go back a little further in time, uh, Eric Kandel was also uh, an associate at NIH. So maybe there are even 11 if we want to count uh, back into the 1950s. Uh, as Dr. Gottesman pointed out, this, this paper published in 2011 uh, highlighted some of the, at that time, accomplishments of the total group beyond the Nobel Prize winners or including them, but, but also including others who did not go on to win Nobel Prizes. They included 64 members of the National Academy of Sciences, 125 members elected to the Institute of Medicine, four of nine NIH directors and 10 of 122 NIH Institute directors. Um, Dr. Gottesman also pointed out, uh, this is a, a little chart from that paper that uh, those that went into academics uh, outperformed their peers who were not trained at NIH uh, during this period. They were three times more likely to become a dean, two times more likely to become a department chair, and 50% more likely to achieve the rank of full professor. Now, in talking about this program, uh, we need to go back to somebody who wasn't at NIH, had nothing really directly to do with NIH, a fellow by the name of Frank Berry. Dr. Berry received his MD at Harvard. He did his training in surgery at Bellevue Hospital in New York, served in the Army Medical Corps both in, during both World War I and World War II, ultimately achieving the rank of Brigadier General. But it's his subsequent role in the early 1950s as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health and Medical Affairs that's most relevant to our discussion today. He's the author of what was is described as the so-called Berry Plan. And the Berry Plan basically was an opportunity to uh, take the mandatory doctor draft, which in many ways wasn't working very well for anybody involved. Uh, for the doctors who were just graduating from medical school, if they were drafted, it interrupted their training. They, many of them would have preferred to go on immediately to their internship and residency. 
certainly for the military, they would want more experienced physicians. So having some additional time for training of the people that ultimately came into military service uh, was desirable. And furthermore, the hospitals around the country that depended upon physicians to staff their medical services, so-called resident or house staff physicians, uh, were worried about loss of, of their workforce during the mandatory doctor draft during the Korean War. So Barry worked out a compromise. What, he, what his plan involved was if someone opted into this, and over time, 42,000 physicians did, that would uh, give the physicians a, a deferral so that they could complete uh, some advanced clinical training. It would provide the military with more skilled uh, trained physicians, and it would assure a workforce for the civilian hospitals. Now, physicians didn't have to opt into this. They could take their chances on whether they would be drafted or not, but the vast majority chose to participate. But the interesting part of this plan, which is relevant to our talk today, is that it created an alternative service pathway to serving in the military by serving, as, as Dr. Gottesman said, in the Commission Corps of the US Public Health Service. And specifically, the opportunities were at the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Indian Health Service. Now, we're particularly focused on the NIH Associate Training Program, the ATP program. And this is uh, a slide to give you a sense of how selective that program was. Each year, there were about 7,500 at the time uh, senior medical students. They would apply during their last year of medical school to the public health service. And uh, of those, there, uh, there were probably about somewhere, depending on the year, between 1,500 and 2,000 applicants. Out of that pool, they were then screened by NIH to select a, uh, a group to be interviewed in person by laboratory directors. And that was the, the most intense screening process between the application and being invited to interview. You can see only about a fifth or a sixth of the applicants ended up being invited. If you got invited, there was a pretty good chance that you would be matched with an NIH laboratory uh, trying to match your interests with those of the uh, NIH labs. And about 200 at the peak uh, were admitted to this program. Uh, this, and this was all done as the uh, medical students were graduating. They would then spend two years in their internship and residency, and then come to the NIH the following year. Now, uh, Dr. Gottesman already alluded to the fact that the official name was the uh, Associate Training Program, ATP, but there was an unofficial name, the so-called Yellow Berets. And for those who didn't live through this era, you may be wondering, what's that all about? Well, it was basically a contrast with the Green Berets, who were the special services uh, 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 group of in the Army and celebrated at that time for the heroics that they were performing in, in the war in Vietnam. So the moniker arose sort of tongue in cheek, uh, maybe a little derogatory as sort of a contrast to, to the, the, the Green Berets. Over time, those who were a little bit sensitive about whether it was derogatory, I think have come to appreciate the fact that it's really sort of a badge of honor. Having been selected into this program really was a distinction. And the graph here, again, comes from the, the same 2011 paper, shows you that during the period of the war, the numbers, this almost looks like a pandemic curve here, escalated very rapidly to about a little over 200 a year. And then as the war uh, wound down, around the time that Dr. Gottesman came to NIH, uh, there was a dramatic fall off in the number of applicants from, from uh, the end of the war in 1973. Uh, so the program really peaked during the Vietnam War. Now, why did the NIH want physicians to come for training? Well, uh, the, they were running, as those of you involved with the NIH knows, one of the largest, if not the largest, research hospital in the world. Uh, and they needed physicians to help care for the patients who were brought in for experimental treatments. So the physicians who were recruited were, uh, took care of patients, but they also, during their, their time there, worked in basic science laboratories, conducted re conducting research. Now, the amount of clinical versus research time varied widely by the program that one was admitted to. So let me just give sort of two extreme examples. Joe Goldstein, who uh, was selected to the National Heart Institute, 
uh, spent about 80% of his time in the research laboratory and 20% doing clinical work. Whereas his colleague, uh, Mike Brown, who was initially selected into uh, the gastroenterology program, spent only about 30% of his time initially in research and 70% doing clinical work. That changed uh, when he changed laboratories. Now, a little bit about the, the NIH Clinical Center at the time. Of course, it has had many additions and grown tremendously since the time, but uh, it was opened originally in uh, July of 1953, so it is almost uh, 70 years old now. The original clinical center was 1.3 million square feet of space. It was the largest brick building in the world, 7 million bricks. I don't know if somebody actually counted them. That sounds like counting votes in Georgia would be just as big a challenge, but uh, reputed to have 7 million bricks in it. Um, now, one of the fascinating things about the design, which you can see on this uh, typical floor plan, is that patient rooms in the upper part of the center were surrounded on all, all sides, essentially, by laboratories for investigation. Now, the idea was to, to bring the researchers in the closest possible proximity to the patients. It really was cutting edge, thinking about uh, translational research from bench to bedside and from bedside back to bench. The, um, the model, however, you know, was pointed out to me by Jesse Roth, one of the mentors, had some potential downsides in uh, that having the patients so close to the laboratories that sometimes you had patients wandering in to labs. Uh, they were not secured in the way that they would be secured today. Plus, if you had an explosion or a release of toxic substances, that could be a problem. So you probably wouldn't design a facility with this kind of intimacy of the patients and laboratories today, but at the time, it was truly a cutting edge facility. And in 1968, when our trainees that we'll be talking about came, there were 500 plus patient rooms, about 4,000 admissions a year. So you can see that on average, patients stayed for quite some duration of time, depending upon the research protocol. At the time, there were around 1,400 research protocols underway. I would imagine that's a small number compared to uh, what's going on today, but, but still a very, uh, very large spectrum of research being conducted. And interestingly enough, uh, this of course was during the Vietnam War, so they were conscientious objectors. One way that they could provide national service other than the military was to serve as normal patients uh, as comparison subjects for studies uh, of patients that were brought into the clinical center. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, what I'm referring to as the Fab Four of 1968, the group that came in of, of the nine that Goldstein and Brown wrote about. They themselves came in 68, Harold Varmus and Bob Lefkowitz came in in that same year. I should point out it's really the Fab Five that came in in, that, in 1968 uh, because Tony Fauci also was a member of that same class. He, he hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet, but he's won just about other, every other distinction in science and uh, certainly uh, uh, it's an honor to add him to that group as well. So let me spend a minute or two talking about the background of these four individuals before they got to the National Institutes of Health. Joe Goldstein was born in rural South Carolina uh, his colleague, Mike Brown, refers to it, King Street is not the middle of nowhere because the middle of nowhere is actually a place. King Street is off to the side of the middle of nowhere in South Carolina, a really small little town where Joe was uh, clearly the, the, uh, the cream of the crop in his high school. He edited the school newspaper. This is a theme, by the way, that we'll come back to. You'll see that uh, all four of these individuals wrote for their school newspapers or yearbooks had a great interest in writing before they actually had an interest in science. Um, he edited the yearbook at Washington and Lee where he went to college. He graduated as the valedictorian there. He then chose to go uh, probably an unusual route to the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, the Southwestern Medical School, which uh, Mike Brown, when he first heard about it, uh, thought that it was a, a Bible school. Uh, so it was not yet the prestigious institution that it has uh, subsequently become a major research university. While there, Joe Goldstein uh, performed some uh, clinically oriented research uh, with faculty members. He was identified by several faculty members, including Donald Selden, the then 
uh, chairman of medicine who made a practice of identifying the very best medical students, sending them off to the best training programs around the country, all with the intent that they would come back to Southwestern and become faculty members leading the school in the future. Uh, Joe finished uh, first in his class and received the Hodin Award uh, given to the student who best exemplifies knowledge, understanding, and compassion. Mike Brown, his colleague, was born in Brooklyn and then raised uh, from the age of 11 beyond in the northern suburbs of Philadelphia. He again was, uh, he was a sports editor for his high school newspaper. He uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania on a scholarship which was supposed to be for academic merit. Turns out he was one of the, the few actually on academic merit. The rest of his in his class were uh, members of the football team. So Mike was the ringer who was selected to help bring up the grade point average for the group. He was briefly the editor of the student newspaper where he uh, almost, almost got it uh, canceled and then uh, got it reinstalled for some of the um, uh, parody issues that they uh, wrote about that the administration wasn't too thrilled about. So he was, he was a little bit of a troublemaker uh, even as a college uh, student. He did some summer research at the pharmaceutical house Smith Klein and French in Philadelphia, stayed at the University of Pennsylvania for medical school and won the prize for uh, highest performance in internal medicine and uh, was competing as the, what, the highest uh, student in his class. This is a photograph from Massachusetts General Hospital. Both Joe and Mike were accepted as interns at this prestigious hospital. You see uh, Joe circled on the far left in the third row and Mike circled uh, in the uh, far right on the second row. This is where they met and became fast friends. They were, uh, they immediately recognized that they shared interest in understanding not just how to take care of patients, but the underlying disease mechanisms uh, involved in the disease. Now, Harold Varma certainly is a well-known uh, really an institution at NIH. He, uh, as, as many of you know, went on to become both the director of the National Cancer Institute as well as the director of NIH overall. Uh, he was born in Freeport, Long Island. His father is the only one who uh, had a nuclear family member who was uh, in medicine. Uh, he uh, was the editor of his school newspaper at uh, Amherst where he went to college. He was really struggling as, in, as a senior in college about what his career pathway should be. Should he go into the family business of medicine or should he pursue his other passion, which was English literature? And actually English literature initially won out. He went to Harvard as a graduate student, but pretty quickly decided that that was not for him. Uh, he got his master's degree and then went to medical school uh, at Columbia University uh, in New York City. And uh, I thought interestingly enough, it's not unusual today for a student to take an elective in international health working in a foreign country, but at the time it was a very unusual thing. Uh, and he, he was really interested in the possibility of pursuing uh, global health work at, uh, at the time. Bob Lefkowitz, the last of our quartet, was born in 1943 in Bronx. He graduated from the Bronx High School of Science, which many of you know has been a major feeder for I think they're up to 10 or 11, somewhere in that ballpark. Almost all of them, by the way, in physics. Uh, uh, Bob is, is unusual. He won his in chemistry, uh, but he graduated. Not only did he go to the Bronx uh, High School of Science, but he graduated at age 16. He, was, uh, he went to Columbia University. He was the sub-editor of the college yearbook there. Uh, graduated from Columbia at age 19, so he was still on a very, very fast track. He stayed at Columbia for uh, medical school and won the Janeway Prize uh, for the student with the highest achievement and abilities. Uh, here's a picture from the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons yearbook showing uh, Harold Varmus on the left and Bob Lefkowitz on the right sharing a joke uh, in the physical diagnosis class. So this must have been either their first or second year of medical school. So they were friends uh, early too. And here they are, they both stayed at uh, Columbia Presbyterian for their internship and residency. Bob is uh, on the end of the first row here and Harold is uh, standing in, uh, in the far left end of the, of the last row. Now, 
Part of what made this program so special was the quality of the NIH mentors that were involved uh, in the training of these individuals during their, their um, ATP years at NIH. Marshall Nirenberg was the mentor for Joe Goldstein, Earl Stockman for Mike Brown. Uh, Ira Paston actually mentored two, uh, Harold Varmus uh, and Bob Lefkowitz, and uh, Jesse Roth was kind of a partner in, in, uh, in the mentorship for Bob Lefkowitz. So let me, let me talk about the, the mentors a little bit. Marshall Nirenberg, of course, is a legend at NIH. He was born in 1927 in New York City. And at the age of 10, contracted rheumatic fever, which caused the family to move to Florida, the more temperate climate. Uh, and uh, there, Marshall went on to attend the University of Florida. He was kind of a C plus student. He re was really sort of undistinguished as an undergraduate, obtained uh, his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Michigan, and then came to NIH uh, in the early 1950s uh, to undertake a, a postdoc. He didn't publish a lot while he was there. So there were some people who thought maybe he wasn't the most promising candidate for hiring into a staff scientist position, but the decision was made to hire him. And then he did a remarkable thing. He totally ch changed the direction of his research career. He had, not, he had no prior experience in genetics at all, but he, he saw the biggest problem of the day was cracking the genetic code, how genetic information is transferred from uh, genetic material DNA into uh, the proteins that it, uh, are transcribed from it. The, uh, the, probably the, the biggest uh, landmark experiment that was conducted was uh, performed by him in 1961 with the postdoc. They took a synthetic chain of, uh, of just U uh, uh, uracil uh, uh, nucleotides and to see what kind of protein or peptide that would generate. And it was all phenylalanine amino acids. So they, that was the first break in the code. If you had three U's in sequence, you were going to code for phenylalanine. Now there were, of course, 64 different combinations that had to be uh, deciphered uh, through all sorts of creativity. And very quickly after this finding was announced, Nobel laureate Severo Ochoa, who had a very big and very successful laboratory at uh, NYU, joined in the competition, which put Nirenberg, who was a, a, a young scientist with really uh, no, uh, you know, other than a postdoc, really had no lab uh, personnel to, to partner with them. And what happened was, NIH co colleagues rallied around him. People that were working with nucleotides gave him synthetic nucleotides. Uh, they, they uh, roughly 20 individuals were involved in coming to Nirenberg's aid and, uh, and ultimately helping him uh, lead the, the decoding. Uh, after uh, Ochoa backed out of the, the race, uh, another very experienced, very talented uh, biochemist, Hargobin, Corana joined the race. Uh, ultimately, Nirenberg uh, came to the finish line first, but Corana, Nirenberg, and Robert Holly from Cornell University were all selected as uh, recipients of the Nobel Prize for uh, Physiology and Medicine in 1968. So about four months after Joe Goldstein arrived in Nirenberg's lab is when Nirenberg won the Nobel Prize. So we have one of the uh, lineages. A lot has been written about Nobel laureates training with other Nobel laureates. This is a great example of, uh, of that happening. Uh, this was the first Nobel laureate awarded to an NIH staff scientist. Of course, a number of others have gone on to subsequently win Nobel Prizes. Uh, that list includes uh, Julie Axelrod, Chris Anfinson, uh, Gajizuk, and Martin Rodbell, and uh, of course, Harvey Alter, and I'm probably missing uh, more, but uh, it's it's now become quite a pipeline. And here you see uh, the staff in uh, Nirenberg's lab put out a poster when his uh, Nobel Prize was awarded. You, you, you are great, Marshall, uh, citing the, of course, the polyuracil experiment. So Joe Goldstein came in as Marshall was uh, getting his Nobel Prize. And at this point, uh, Nirenberg, again, completely changed directions of his research. He started moving 
into the neurosciences, brand new area. And he had uh, the, the gen genetic decoding uh, process was in a mopping up phases at this point. And he appointed Tom Kasky, one of his former trainees to oversee this work. So on a day-to-day -day basis, Joe Goldstein, who you'll see pictured here in his uh, NIH application uh, photograph, uh, start worked with Tom Kasky on the process that ends uh, the, ch the, the generation of peptide change. It's the stop signs uh, for when to, to stop the transcription. Uh, this, uh, an important part, even though he spent the vast majority of his time in doing basic science research, the clinical service was very important to Goldstein because one of the patients he saw in the National Heart Institute service was a young girl, six years old, and her nine-year-old brother who had familial hypercholesterolemia. They had the dizygotic or two G gene uh, defect, inherited one from the father, one from the mother, which is the extreme severe form of the disease, which has cholesterol levels that are about 10 times normal. And with cholesterol levels that high, even in childhood, a six-year-old child, uh, child was experiencing uh, angina pectoris, one of the symptoms of of uh, coronary artery disease. This so impressed Goldstein that uh, this genetic defect could lead to such uh, dramatic uh, complications. This is ultimately what inspired their Nobel Prize work. Earl Stockman was the mentor for Mike Brown. Earl was a biochemist. He was, uh, he and, and Nirenberg, neither of them were physicians, they were PhDs. Uh, Earl was born in New Mexico, but raised in Southern California, graduated from UC Berkeley where he met and married a fellow graduate student, uh, Teresa Terry Campbell, uh, in 1943. They both finished their PhDs under the same mentor, H.A. Barker, uh, who did biochemistry studies of bacteria, particularly anaerobic oxygen-hating bacteria. Uh, Earl then went on to a postdoc with Fritz Lippmann. This is part of the the NIH uh, pedigree, although Stockman won virtually every prize in science other than the Nobel Prize, he himself didn't, but his one of his mentors, Fritz Lippmann, did uh, three years after uh, Stockman was with him, won the Nobel Prize. Terry, by the way, did her postdoc with Chris Anfinson before he came, he was still in Boston at the time, before he came to NIH, uh, who subsequently went on to win the Nobel Prize too. So you have a husband and wife, both of whom did training under different Nobel laureates. They accepted staff positions at NIH in 1950, and this is an interesting story in itself. They were looking for academic jobs, but at the time, most research universities had very strict nepotism rules. Of course, there weren't that many, sadly, uh, female scientists at the time, but when you had two uh, faculty members and a, and a married couple, most universities wouldn't hire them because of nepotism. But the NIH did not have that restriction, and so very early on in NIH, you had a number of husband and wife teams, including the Stotmans, uh, who uh, uh, spent their careers uh, at the institution. Uh, both Stotmans studied metabolism, particularly uh, enzyme uh, uh, mechanisms in bacteria, particularly anaerobic bacteria. Now, Mike Brown's work, he started, he originally matched in Leonard Laster's lab. Leonard Laster was a gastroenterologist Interestingly enough, uh, the card that you filled out your, your rank order of choices, I think had something like 10 or 12 spaces. Mike Brown ran out of spaces, but he wanted to assure the chance that he, he would uh, maximize his opportunity. So he added a few lines of his own, including Laster was about a, a dozen down on the list. And, and Laster actually selected him because he had been at a talk in uh, major meetings in Atlantic City where Mike, as a, as a medical student, talked about the work that he had done uh, with uh, uh, the pharmaceutical research, and that convinced Laster that he would be a good pick. So by the skin of his teeth, Brown was selected uh, to work with Laster. But Laster, uh, in, in Mike's uh, first year, was appointed by, uh, to the president's Office of Science and Technology as a health advisor. And therefore, Mike was left without an advisor and uh, switched labs, was accepted into the Stockman lab. Uh, and uh, because he had, had basically came in a year late, was uh, allowed to extend his appointment an additional year. He worked on an interesting enzyme uh, 
involving glutamine uh, called glutamine synthetase, which is involved in converting ammonia to glutamine in bacteria. And the interesting work that Mike did, his discovery there was that um, the same enzyme that was involved in activating glutamine synthetase was also involved in deactivating it. And the difference was uh, whether uh, another molecule, UTP, was around or not determined whether it was an activation or a deactivation step. But, but Mike's real experience here was learning how to uh, um, isolate enzymes and work with them. The next mentor was Ira Paston. Uh, Dr. Paston uh, was uh, born in uh, Winthrop, Massachusetts and uh, attended medical school, college and medical school in uh, Boston at Tufts University. He interned, he was interested in endocrinology, had, had done some work in medical school in endocrinology. So he went to Yale, which had a very prominent endocrinology program. And then from there came himself as an NIH associate in 1959 to 61, where he worked on the thyroid. Um, he, when he finished his, his uh, clinical associate program, he felt like he still needed more training in basic uh, biochemistry. And so he himself, like Mike Brown, after him, went to work with Earl Stottman. Stottman was thought of as the biochemist biochemist. And uh, so for uh, two additional years, Ira worked with Stottman. Then in 63, Ira became a staff scientist. He uh, partnered shortly thereafter with Jesse Roth, and they, they together worked on the issues of isolating and characterizing cell surface hormone receptors. Ira, by the way, uh, is still alive and very active uh, as a member of the staff of the National Cancer Institute. Now, Jesse Roth, uh, who I just mentioned partnering with Ira, uh, was born in 1934 in Brooklyn. He graduated from Columbia and uh, he was in the very first class, the inaugural class of the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. He then went on to complete uh, his internship and residency at Washington University. And he was very interested in endocrinology and the Corys and others were there at the time Nobel subsequently won Nobel Prizes. He, he led a charmed life. He, he um, didn't have a postdoc all lined up and at the last minute uh, was able to get into a postdoc at the uh, VA hospital in the Bronx, which doesn't sound like a particularly prestigious postdoc, but he was admitted in the lab of Saul Burson and uh, Roz Yallo who started working together in the early 1950s and in 1960 published a seminal paper uh, on the radioimmunoassay. This was critical to the study of hormones which are present in very, very small quantities in blood and you needed a very, very sensitive test to pick them up and that's what the radioimmunoassay was. Uh, Yalo subsequently won the Nobel Prize for that work. Burson unfortunately had passed away and so uh, was not a co-recipient of that Nobel Prize. But here again is a link to uh, Roth didn't himself win a Nobel Prize, but he worked for a Nobel laureate. He uh, was appointed a staff scientist in 63 and partnered, as I mentioned, with Ira Paston on hormone receptors. Now, I should point out that hormone receptors had been talked about for many years, decades in advance of this, but even the people who were sort of the inventors of the concept thought of them more as a theoretical construct than an actual biological entity. They thought about them for pharmacokinetics purposes, but not they, they, some of them, including the most famous ones, doubted that they actually existed as a physical entity. So Bob Lefkowitz came in. He had never conducted research. This is, to me, one of the interesting things about, I think all of us have the preconception that people that go, go on to win Nobel Prizes must have known they were going to be uh, a scientist since uh, they were three years old. That's not true. None of these uh, four had extensive research experience before they came to NIH. They might have done some research in medical school, uh, but it was, was, wasn't really fundamental basic research. Um, Bob had absolutely no research experience whatsoever, and he didn't particularly at the time have a, an idea that that was what he wanted to do. His model was to uh, become a a clinician faculty member. His first year, like many people just entering research, was a tough year. He just couldn't get things to work and he got extremely frustrated. And by Thanksgiving of that year, he was so frustrated that he decided this wasn't for him. He was gonna start applying for cardiology fellowships 
uh, so that he would move after his training at NIH back into the clinical arena. And he was accepted at, at Mass General Hospital for, for a cardiology fellowship. And then this story, it's, it's sort of like the anecdotes of couples that are trying to conceive and they can't and they can't and they finally decide they're, they're going to adopt. And as soon as they adopt, they, have, they conceive on their own. Uh, as soon as he was accepted into this cardiology fellowship, he came back to the laboratory and had a major breakthrough. He was able to radio label um, ACTH, uh, uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone. That was what they were studying. And once it was labeled, they could then look at its interaction with fragments of adrenal tissue. He was able to demonstrate binding to the membrane. And it was really uh, the first solid demonstration of a self-surface hormone receptor. A flood of work was done subsequent to that at NIH on, on other uh, self surface cell surface hormone receptors. Harold Varmus, who worked with uh, Ira Pastin, when he was selected to, by Ira, and Ira chose him not because he was a great scientist, he hadn't done any, any research as a, as a uh, medical student, but Harold, as I mentioned, was very interested in um, English literature and Ira's wife, Linda, was a poet. And so uh, Ira and Linda thought, it would be, Linda thought it would be wonderful to have a fellow who worked in the lab who also had some interest in literature. When he was selected, he was selected, uh, the project they talked about was to work on thyroid hormone. And then uh, Harold went back to uh, finish his clinical work. He gets a call one day from Ira, very excitedly saying, he's decided to open a, a whole new line of research uh, and this is what Harold is going to work on when he gets there about a gene regulation. And in particular, what he was very interested in was the role uh, of uh, uh, lactose metabolites and cyclic AMP in, in regulating gene expression. And what they discovered, the work that uh, Harold did there, was the first demonstration that genes could be regulated affirmatively, positively, rather than the traditional model that had been previously demonstrated of, of negative regulation, down regulation from uh, products that were, that were generated. Uh, this was, at the time it came out, uh, challenged by many of the more established uh, genetic researchers until it was uh, subsequently confirmed. So this is the, that we, that's the work that was done at NIH. And now let me shift to the Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, Brown and Goldstein, work together. And this is uh, obviously kind of a staged photograph at University of Texas Southwestern, but it's, it's key because it, it really demonstrates the complementary skills of Joe, who's at the microscope, and Mike, who's standing watching over his uh, left shoulder there. Um, they've talked about how they each bring different perspectives to research. Joe is, uh, looks at things in great detail. Uh, so when he's at the microscope, he dials things up to the highest possible power. And then when Mike takes over at the microscope, he dials it back down to low power because he wants to see the overall global picture. And those complementary interests and skills really made them a dynamic duo. They are still, remarkably enough, working together uh, you know, more than 50 years after their collaboration started, the longest lived such collaboration. They didn't really intend to work entirely together. They uh, started out thinking they would run separate laboratories at Southwestern, but they picked one joint project to work on. And this involved combining Goldstein's skills that he acquired uh, in culturing human fibroblasts with Brown's enzyme experience that he acquired in NIH. And what they were looking at was a critical enzyme in the pathway to making cholesterol, HMG-CoA reductase activity, and they were able to show that uh, people who have normal fibroblasts, um, skin cells that are grown up in culture, if you flood them with LDL cholesterol, uh, low density lipoprotein, it shuts down the manufacturing by the cell itself of cholesterol. Uh, they then were able to isolate some fibroblasts from a patient with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia and discovered that it was totally non-responsive to LDL cholesterol. However, it was responsive to cholesterol when that was put in the, the bath that, was, that uh, was around the cells. So they, by um, working through this, they figured out that 
there was a receptor on the surface uh, that was necessary for bringing LDL into the cell where it could then affect uh, the performance of this enzyme. They were able to isolate the cell surface receptor for LDL. They were able to clone the, the DNA for it. Uh, they could then sequence it uh, and began a catalog of mutations uh, that led to uh, uh, F, uh, fam uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, of which there are now, I believe, well over 100 such that have been identified. And they also, this work laid the groundwork for statins, which are drugs that uh, interfere with HMG uh, CoA reductase activity. They themselves didn't work on statins, but they, they kind of paved the pathway for that work. Bishop and Varmus, again, uh, you got a, a pair that worked together. Bishop himself, as you may remember from one of the early slides, was one of the clinical associates a few years ahead of Harold Varmus. They worked together at the University of California, San Francisco. They worked in cancer. They, they developed a, a DNA probe for the Rouse sarcoma virus uh, and were able to identify a cancer-causing gene or so-called oncogene. They then demonstrated that the oncogene derives from a precursor, a proto-oncogene, which was present in normal chickens that didn't develop cancer. They then went on to discover that that proto-oncogene was not just present in chickens, it was also in ducks and quail and turkeys, and even in the most genetically remote, evolutionarily remote uh, bird, which is the emu. Uh, so that meant that that proto-oncogene had been around for at least 100 million years. They then went on to show that it was in not just fowls, but in normal vertebrates, such as salmon, mice, calves, and humans, but not in invertebrates. So somewhere around on the evolutionary scale between invertebrates and when vertebrates broke off is when the proto-oncogene first got integrated. They discovered that the proto-oncogene was involved in cell signaling, which helped to control and regulate cell growth and differentiation. And of course, uh, one of the problems of cancer is the loss of normal cell regulation uh, of growth and, and differentiation. Uh, and so the oncogene is really the, uh, the mutated, uh, non-controlling part of the genetic material. They then went on to discover another oncogene, uh, MYC, uh, which is found in birds as well. Uh, and of course, there is now a, a huge library of uh, oncogenes that have been identified. Finally, Lefkowitz uh, and his subsequent partner, another pair that uh, were recognized together. Uh, uh, Brian Kabilka was actually a fellow who worked uh, with, with Bob Lefkowitz. Now, Bob, as you may recall, worked on the receptor for adrenocorticotropic hormone. But when he subsequently went into cardiology, he decided he'd much rather shift over from uh, adrenal cortical hormones and those mechanisms to the sympathetic nervous system that's so involved in regulation of heart rate and, and function and, and hypertension. Uh, so he switched to the adrenergic, the adrenaline receptors. Uh, they were able to isolate uh, multiple adrenergic receptors. Um, people doubted that what they had isolated was the, the receptors themselves. So that they brilliant experiment went on to, to take cells that didn't, red blood cells that didn't have adrenergic receptors, they weren't responsive to uh, adrenaline, insert them into those cells, and then demonstrate that they subsequently became responsive to adrenaline. So this was a, a functional demonstration of the existence of adrenergic receptors. Kabilka then, while working for Lefkowitz, went on to clone um, the, uh, the gene for the beta-2 uh, receptor. And then they discovered that the structure of the, the protein that came out of this had seven areas that uh, were hydrophobic, that uh, were the kinds of areas that would cross the cell membrane, the central part of the cell membrane, and they would do it seven times, wind in and out of the cell seven times, like a snake. Um, and uh, then the remarkable thing was, not long before that, a very similar seven membrane crossing uh, structure was seen for another receptor, this one for rhodopsin, which is in the eye, a pigment uh, in the uh, rod cells of the eye. So here you had two very different kinds of functions, all uh, with a very similar structure. And what they then went on to discover is that this, this structure was common to all uh, G-protein coupled receptors. 
uh, really landmark work. And the interesting thing is that they won the Nobel Prize not in physiology and medicine, but in chemistry uh, because of the work to, uh, to solve the three-dimensional structure of beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptor that Kadilka uh, did uh, subsequent to, to leaving Duke with uh, Bob Lefkowitz, went on to Stanford for the rest of his career. Uh, in conclusion, I, I really, there are a lot of people I need to thank here. All four of the Nobel laureates that I've talked about were incredibly helpful beyond personal interviews and, and uh, providing lots of information for this talk. The two surviving mentors, uh, Drs. Paston and Roth, again, were wonderfully helpful. Um, I also interviewed other members of the class of 1968. The NIH Office of History is a gem that uh, is probably not as widely known as it should be. They identified the actual application cards and photographs, as well as photo, uh, other photograph documentation and other resources. Um, Barbara Harkins, who has since retired as the head of that office, uh, and Michelle Lyons, who uh, works in the office, uh, wonderful assistance in, in all of this work, and, and Chris Wanjek, uh, who uh, oversees that and, and many, many other functions at NIH. I uh, just can't, my hats are uh, off to, to all of you. Um, my colleagues at uh, NIH uh, and my colleagues at UT uh, also uh, I need to thank. And with that, uh, uh, we're closing in on the end of the hour, but I think there's probably time for a few questions if there are any. Ray, thank you for a really stimulating and interesting talk. You know, as a, a member of this cohort, I'm particularly fascinated by how these things come about. We do have a number of questions and let me start with those. Um, first one says, thank you for uncovering this fascinating slice of NIH history. I've heard stories of doctors who did go to war and gained insights from their service. Is there a similar cohort of warrior doctors who also went on to great things? Any, any thoughts about that? Right, so um, by that, I assume that the, the question really um, pertains to those who went into military service. I see. And I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. If you compare military medicine, I, I'm, I'm gonna have a hard time coming up with, with uh, the names of specific individuals, but, but you know, the work that came out of Vietnam on how to manage trauma is just one example of, uh, of extraordinary work that uh, has now completely transformed uh, the care of wounded uh, warriors in field as well as when they're brought back to, uh, to uh, hospital care. So there is absolutely no question that, in, uh, that the physicians who served in Vietnam performed invaluable service. Uh, one of my good friends and colleagues uh, went on subsequent to his service in Vietnam to train at Walter Reed uh, and uh, uh, then became the physician to uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. Uh, Larry Moore. So a number of them went into national service beyond uh, their time in the military. So let me quit there. But yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that uh, wonderful record of service for those uh, physicians. Maybe an argument for national service for physicians. <laughs> yes. Um, but particularly if some of the cost of their medical education could be paid for. <laughs> absolutely. Um, here's another one. Thank you for this great talk. How closely was this NIH program wed to the doctor's draft? Was it created to take advantage of the draft? Did it end because the draft ended? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a great question. And it's absolutely, in my opinion, uh, highly correlated. The, the graph that I showed uh, from the paper by Cott et al, um, the peak really picked up in, in the NIH program uh, around 1966 as the war was escalating, uh, continued into the early 1970s when, when you were there, Dr. Gottesman, uh, and then really trailed off after peace was declared. Uh, so I, I think you know, the, it, what it did was encourage the best and brightest um, medical students who are interested in research careers uh, to come to the NIH. It, it also, by the way, I spent the early part of my career at Emory University right next to the CDC. And the CDC, um, the EIS officers, the Epidemic Intelligence Service at the CDC benefited from the same selective uh, factor and, and the Yellow Berets played an absolutely crucial role at the CDC. So um, 
this program, I, I, it could have existed, but it would not have been nearly as successful as it was attracting the best and brightest if it wasn't for the military draft being uh, kind of the uh, incentive for, for people to choose the public health service. So another um, fascinating talk. What attracted you as an epidemiologist to this topic? That's a great question. So uh, I am a recovering epidemiologist. I've spent more of my time over the past uh, few decades doing research. I've always had an interest in the history of medicine and medical biography and just never really before had uh, time to uh, pursue it. So I had a sabbatical, which gave me an opportunity to spend my time doing this work. To be honest with you, I was really initially interested in writing about uh, Joe Goldstein and Mike Brown, uh, who were not ready to have a biography written about them. They, they felt that they were still very active in their careers and that people might think that they were retiring if the biography came out. Uh, but they were more than happy to have the story of their training at NIH and you know, building off of the paper that they wrote uh, in 2012, published in Science on this golden era. And so um, it was effectively a compromise. Uh, I could write about Joe and Mike, as well as Bob and, and Harold, uh, without appearing to suggest that any of them are at the end of their careers. They're all, as they enter their 80s or approach their 80s, they're all amazingly active uh, in the research laboratory and other domains. So here's an interesting question. Um, clearly, the ATP gave members a unique opportunity. Would you comment on the legacy of the program on the male dominance in the field? Oh. As a male-only program, the emerging group of female scientists did not have the same opportunities. Yeah, so um, that, is, that is, a I think, a very key issue. First of all, uh, you got to remember that uh, at the time we're talking about, which was uh, med medical school graduating class of 1966 for the four individuals selected here. Sadly, there weren't that many women in medical school at the time. So I think Tony Fauci in an interview said in his graduating class at Cornell, there were, the, when the military recruiter came in, there were something like 78 medical students that were graduating in that class I believe there were only two or three women in that entire class. So that gives you some, some sense of how, how few women, not just were in science, but were in medicine at the time. Of course, today you have, I think we've crossed the threshold now where more than half of American medical students are female. So a, a tremendous transformation has taken place in women entering the field of medicine. Um, there were also few women uh, who were entering research careers at that time, but there were some, and, and you know, a key one to, to mention uh, was uh, Bernadine Healy, who subsequently went on to become NIH director and many other prestigious positions. But uh, she came uh, during the same period of time uh, into the associate program. So, the, what I've read about the history wasn't that they actively re restricted it to males, but they had very few female applicants. That's one explanation. Others would say maybe they gave men preferential treatment because men were the only ones that were subject to the military draft. So I'm not sure what the right answer to that is. There, there are two different explanations that I've heard, but it, it is a sad reflection of where we were in our history in terms of women entering both medicine and science at the time. There were very, very few. Yeah, you know, I could add, um, I graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1970, and there were 10 women in my class, one of whom was Bernadine Healy. Uh, the other <laughs> did extremely well. Um, and it, it was always, even then, it was quite an embarrassment, uh, hard to explain why so few women were in medicine. And clearly, there were factors that were uh, uh, acting to keep women out of medicine. Hopefully, that's changed now. So uh, here's a speculative question. <laughs> Um, if the four scientists that we're discussing today uh, had gone into military service, what likely would have they done in, <laughs> in the military? <laughs> I don't know how you can answer that, but. Well, you know, it's interesting. Not, not everybody who was drafted actually went into Vietnam. Many of them served in, in hospitals around the world, uh, including in the United States where, where 
the, um, either in Hawaii or in, in other destinations where um, patients, uh, wounded warriors were, were transferred for their care. So likely um, they, they would have been in the service. I should point out that um, even those who were in the, uh, some who were in the ATP program actually took care of wounded warriors. Tony Fauci has talked about in an interview that was conducted that there wasn't an, at the time, it's hard to believe today, but at the time uh, there was not an infectious disease service at the National Naval Medical Center, which is directly across the street from the NIH. And so uh, his mentor and his colleagues effectively became the infectious disease service. They would go and round on patients uh, who had infected wounds and, and other problems. Uh, so they were actually taking care uh, of, uh, of wounded warriors during Vietnam. Now that was unusual. Very few of the, of the clinical associates were involved in, in the care of, of military personnel, but there were some who were, and, and uh, likely they would have staffed, whether it was in Bethesda or somewhere else, uh, these four probably would have gone into, uh, into patient care in, in a military hospital. Now, maybe part of the question is also, what would they have done after their service? I think they all probably would have ended up in academic medicine. They all talked about that when they applied to NIH as their ultimate goal was to be a faculty member. Although I think when in, if push came to shove, most of them probably saw their model as Tony Fauci did as being mostly a clinician, maybe puttering around in the laboratory as a, a, an avocation, but, but not as the primary focus of their research. Now that may be a little unfair, but, but most of them you have to recall didn't really have a lot of research experience before they came to NIH. So they probably, I think there's a good chance they may not have ended up uh, as, as scientists uh, had they uh, gone to the military and then back into academics. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end of the hour. Ray, let me thank you again for really a very stimulating, uh, entertaining and informative lecture. Um, there, there may be a few residual questions here in the chat room. We'll send them along to you and you can answer them if you would like. Um, well, thanks again, and we'll say goodbye to everybody and enjoy the rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.